Because Jesus, it says, went up on a mount, and there he began to teach his disciples. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. All three chapters contain this sermon. If you have a a uh, Bible with the words of Jesus in red, you'll notice that it's just non-stop red for three chapters. This is his sermon. And we have begun to just go through it a little bit at a time and unpack all that is here, or at least try to anyways. I told you the first Sunday, which was a couple of weeks ago, a couple of warnings about the uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to repeat these. Now, this will be the third week that I bring them up, but I really want to establish this uh, up front uh, as we move through. Number one was this, that this is not the teaching of just outward moralism that can be accomplished through man's efforts. This is very prominent. People will take the Sermon on the Mount and they'll say, this, this is the key. If we, if we just... Can, can reform society and get it to abide by uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, then we'll accomplish heaven on earth. But this Sermon on the Mount, just like the Ten Commandments, shows us how far we have fallen from the glory of heaven, how far we have fallen from the glory of God. And it should drive us to our knees Man can't, through human effort, accomplish what only God can do in the heart. And Jesus saying, speaking to that very, very religious man, Nicodemus, he says to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. And if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You'll not see the kingdom of being born again. And then when Nicodemus asked, how can this be? He said, look to what, the, what I'm going to do at the cross. As the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What is needed is a transformation, being turned into a new creature. And this comes when a man or a woman or a boy or a girl comes by faith to the cross of Jesus Christ in repentance. No, Jesus isn't teaching us a code of moral conduct that we can abide, you know, just pull up the bootstraps and, and get her done. We can't. Not without Him. He must transform us and fill us with His Spirit. And in the power of the Spirit, we can walk in this newness of life. A second warning I gave was that this sermon is for us today. I've talked to several people recently that dismiss it. They say this is, this is old covenant. This is uh, Jesus was teaching the Jewish disciples what needed to be taught to the Jews, but it's not for the Gentile age. This isn't for us today. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The words of Jesus are for us today. In fact, all of the Bible is for us today. There are certain aspects which maybe have been completed and fulfilled that we don't carry on, like the sacrificial system, uh, because Jesus finished the work of the sacrificial system. God established it, and then it came to a close. Uh, but in it, we learn. We learn of the, the, the sacrifice of Christ and what He accomplished at Calvary. Yes, there are some things which uh, were for a, a time to be carried out, but for eternity to teach. And uh, then 
Uh, but having said that, all of it is for us to read and to be exhorted and to learn. And uh, the, the words of Jesus are for us. The teachings of Jesus are for us. Some that say, no, the Gentile age or the gospel age or the age, this dispensation of grace was committed to the Apostle Paul. And uh, so Paul's message is what's for us today. But listen to what Paul said in Romans 13, verses 9 through 10. He says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. I've asked people in the past who want to say that the, the, the law is done away with, which Paul clearly asks, is the law done away with? God forbid. No, it's not. But I, I, I say to them, and I say to you, if you believe that, are we not called to love? Isn't the New Testament, isn't the New Testament church called to love God and love others? I think everybody would agree with that. All right, what does love look like? What, what is the, the practical outworking of love? The Ten Commandments show us what is loving and what is not loving toward God and man. And the Sermon on the Mount does the same. Jesus teaches us what true love for God is. And true love for others looks like it's for us. This Sermon on the Mount is for us today. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then, of course, the last thing that I pointed out was that Jesus in the Great Commission told the disciples to make disciples of all nations, and to go into all the world, making these disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So those who would say that, no, this sermon was to the Jewish disciples who were supposed to take that message to the Jewish people are wrong. Those Jewish disciples were to take this message and these commands to the whole world to every nation, and not just teach them what the Jews were supposed to live by, but teach them to observe the things as well. It's for us today, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount are for you today. All right. And with that, we started off with what is called the Beatitudes. When Jesus said in verse 3, and you can look there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And now today we come to this one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed. This word blessed means happy. Happy. There is a happiness which is holy. There is a, there is a carnal happiness. Delight. There certainly is a carnal pleasure or a carnal happiness. The Bible tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. It's very short-lived because then it always has a payment. It always brings suffering and destruction. Sin always does. But holiness brings true and lasting happiness. We want to be happy. God wants us to be happy. 
But the devil tries to convince us that happiness is found in carnality. Where Jesus is teaching us, no, happiness is found in holiness. What does it look like? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be a happy person? Then be poor in spirit. And then this one that we're looking at today is happy or blessed are the meek. Be meek. What is meek? I like what I heard years ago that meekness is not weakness. It is strength under control. If you look up the word meek, you'll find out that it just means a mild temperament. Uh, a, a gentleness and a calmness of spirit. Certainly, there are times in which uh, maybe I'd use the word uh, an, an extreme uh, temperament is right. Now, Jesus was completely holy. And he was furious when he went into the temple and had been turned into a marketplace. And he was filled with passion as he drove out the money changers, overturning their dust. I mean, can you imagine that? Just get the visual. Jesus is coming through, throwing over tables, <laughs> taking a whip in the one time, and he's driving the people out. Most people would look and say, oh, look at that man. He's so unchristlike." like yeah. And there were times that Jesus was moved with passion. But there was also many, many times in which we saw his meekness. The one in particular. Do you remember when he came riding into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry? And he was meek and lowly, riding upon an ass, the colt, the foal of an ass. Here he comes, riding into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey. Does that sound like the triumphal entry of the King of Kings? <laughs> I mean, the, at the time, the Romans had conquered the world, and they really, they really had a show of their entries into cities. If they would conquer a city or conquer a land, whether they were coming into that city, or mostly when they would get back home to Rome, a king would go out and he would have this military... Uh, uh, campaign, and if he won and came back, when he came back to Rome, they had the biggest parade you'd ever seen. And the king would ride in with all of his army and all on his horse and all his armor. I've seen depictions, maybe you've seen depictions of this. We can see it back, you know, when, it, when it's portrayed of, of, of the ancient Roman uh, military parades. But just think of it today when there is this, a great parade in other countries or even here with all the tanks and all the artillery. And then the, the president or the king or whoever it is just coming in and all this show of force. And now think about it. You've got Jesus on a borrowed donkey with 12 guys, fishermen, you know, ragtag team of misfits. And here they come. They have no red carpet. They just have to throw like palm branches and clothes down on the ground to make some kind of a red carpet. And he's coming in. It was a very meek, very humble entry. He could have come in in such glory 
He will. Just read about it in the book of Revelation. When you read of Jesus coming again as, a, as king of kings, he will come on a white horse. He will come in flaming fire. He'll come with all the saints and with all the hosts of heaven. That's the angel army and the, the, the triumphal entry in the future. Wow. It's going to be the greatest parade that the world has ever seen. And he could have done that then, but he, he didn't. He was very meek. Again, meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. And it's very similar to the first beatitude, which is blessed are the poor in spirit, which we said was humility. Humility and meekness are very close to each other. Within the human heart, the carnal, selfish human heart, we want to be praised. We want to be the greatest. The carnal human heart wants to be the best and get the praise of man. It's the carnal heart. The right heart is the meekness. I think of this meekness and it reminds me of a man and his wife and I knew very meek people and I'm going to share their story here at the end because as they were also hungering and thirsting after righteousness but meekness Blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. Now that strikes me. Again, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The poor in spirit, those who are humble, are going to get heaven. Those who are meek are going to get earth. Heaven and earth. That's the promise. Both places exist. Some people want to deny heaven. Say that there is no heaven. No, there is a heaven. What is it like? I don't know fully. I know a little bit. The Bible says there's streets of gold. There's a sea that's like glass. There's a gate made out of pearls. That's why we call it the pearly gate. There are mansions, there's a throne. There's some things I know about heaven, but most of it I don't. But there is a literal heaven that can be gained. And God says that the poor in spirit are going to get heaven. Now the meek are going to get earth. What does that mean? Remember that ragtag team, like I said, that went into Jerusalem with Jesus, you know, the donkey and these 12 guys, just boneheads. And, and yet Jesus says to them, one day you will sit on 12 thrones. There is coming a day when Jesus does come back and he sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem that the saints, you and I, will rule and reign with Christ. We will be given dominion with Jesus over all the earth. Do you remember the first Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? When God made Adam, he gave him dominion over the world, over everything created. 
That means Adam was the king over God's creation. That was the glorious position that God gave man after he had created everything. He put everything under his feet, gave him to be the authority, and uh, Adam forfeited it. He forfeited it. He lost it. Because it was underneath this authority of God, ultimately, that he had that authority. But he went out from underneath the authority of God and started putting, subjecting himself to the authority of Satan. And paradise was lost. But there was a second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has regained that dominion. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him now. And all things are put under his feet. And yet it says, but we don't see all things put under his feet. Yet, we don't. There is the times of reformation which will come. When Jesus comes and everything is put under his feet. And then we, the church, as his bride will rule and reign over the whole earth with him. You get that visual picture of a king and queen sitting up on the throne. That queen is the church. We will rule and reign the earth with Christ. The Bible says that all the kings of the earth will travel to Jerusalem to worship at the feet of Jesus. They will all be subject to him for a thousand years, what we call the millennial reign. And you and I will be a part of that as the saints. What a blessed thing. What an exciting thing. But it is promised here to the meek. So the natural, reasonable response should be from all of us, I want to be meek then. What does that look like? This is one of the harder things to define. Meekness. The best thing I can say is what does meekness look like is study the life of Christ and follow his example. One of the greatest, I think, demonstrations of his meekness, as I mentioned, the triumphal entry, but probably more than that, is the when Jesus opened not his mouth. Danae told me some time ago, she said, you know what the hardest thing in the world to do is to not say something when you want to say something and you're right and the other person's wrong. <laughs> she said, that's so hard to do. <laughs> Have you ever been there? How many times have you been there? You want to say something, but you hold your tongue. That's really strength under control. There are times that we need to speak. I'm not saying that we never say anything, but there are times that we need to speak. But there are other times that we need to be quiet. Jesus opened not his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He just let it go. One of the greatest signs of meekness is when you are falsely attacked with words that you do not respond.
that you just quietly or or you respond with something completely different by blessing those who are cursing you or something along those lines. Yesterday I was thinking about this and something that happened to me well, close to 15 years ago now. Maybe a little less. But somebody let me have it. <laughs> Just really let me have it with their words. Attacking me for something I had done, which I actually hadn't even done. But they had heard from so-and-so some rumor. And this person just laying into me. Then they weren't alone. A couple other people joined in. <laughs> and uh, yesterday I was thinking about that incident. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I did that, if I handled that right. I should have just set them straight because they didn't even know what they were talking about. Uh, no, at the time I felt the Lord tell me, don't say a word. As Jesus opened not his mouth, you don't open your mouth. And it was very hard for me to do. And you know what? Later, I got condemned. You, you were so arrogant, you didn't even say anything. And I said to the person, I said, that, I said, you know how hard that was for me not to say anything? But when you are being attacked, meekness, hmm, can you just hold your tongue? Oh, but that, that'll be weak. I'll be weak. I gotta... No. Meekness isn't weakness. It's strength under control. There are times that it is right to speak, but there are times, maybe more than not, that we shouldn't say a thing. Again, every area of what, what does meekness look like? I, I, again, just study the life of Christ and see... The meekness all the way from his being born in a stable and wrapped in rags and put in a feeding trough when he could have been in the palace. All the way through to his suffering, a horrible death of the cross. And then to his ascension. Oh, it's somewhat glorious, but it was just with his disciples going up into the clouds. And he says, follow me. Follow Jesus in meekness on this earth, and one day you'll inherit it. Now the next one is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. This one's a little bit easier, I would say, for us to grasp. Blessed are they, happy are the ones that hunger and thirst. Now, think about this. Have you ever been hungry and thirsty? Yesterday, I heard that a lot. In the evening, uh, we, oh, during the day, we had been over at the house. And then uh, Danae and the kids and Kara and the girls were over here working at the church. And they'd worked late. Um, and uh, they got back. I said, well, you want to go? somewhere to eat and yes I said well what do you want and I got this response several times food well what kind of food any kind of food we're hungry we're hungry and then, so we went we got some pizza and oh this is so good and Danae said that's the way get people so hungry and then give them whatever and they'll think it's great but they were everybody was hungry hungry
But the joy and the blessing of the hungry belly, knowing that we're on our way to the restaurant and it's going to be good. Even though I haven't experienced it yet, isn't there great joy in the anticipation? Think about that. You can be hungry or thirsty and just be thinking about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, and it just it's, brings joy. Oh, man going to bite into that steak. Oh, it's going to be so good. You still haven't gotten it yet, but the joy just from knowing. Now think about it. If you didn't know that there was, what if you were broke and homeless and had nothing and you were starving and, and there was no, you couldn't just go get a steak. You couldn't just go get some pizza. You couldn't just go get a cold glass of water. You had nothing. There was no hope of being filled, that would be despair, wouldn't it? I don't know that any of us have ever been there. I mean, none of us have ever been in that place where we didn't have confidence that we were going to be filled. Many people around the world do. We are blessed, though, aren't we? If we want some food, we can go get it. If we're thirsty and we want some drink, we can go get it. And we are a blessed people. Now that's speaking of the appetite of the body, the belly, and the tongue. But Jesus uses this same idea, the hunger and thirst, not for food or drink, but for righteousness. An appetite, a longing, a, 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 a passionate desire for righteousness. Does that describe you? Are you just longing for righteousness? Not what righteousness? Are you longing for righteousness in you, first of all? Do you long to be right in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, in your actions. That's a good desire. That's what I've said this many times. First Timothy it tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Right? We should never be uh, discontent, always wanting more or something else. You know, contentment. But it's with godliness. Contentment is I'm satisfied with what I have. But you know what? When it comes to godliness, should we be satisfied? Some, somebody, Danae asked somebody, one time she said, you know, you know, how's your how's your walk with the Lord? And they said, Well, I'm not really worried about it right now. <laughs> not really worried about it. I'm not really pushing it. Uh, you know, it's it just is what it is. It's good. Hey, if that's your attitude, if you say, Oh, I'm I'm just content, you know, I'm I'm good with where I am with God, you know. I'm, that's not right. You see, we should be longing for more. One hymn says, I want more of Jesus. More and more and more. I want more of Jesus than I have ever had before. I want more of His great love, so rich and full and free. I want more of Jesus so I'll give him more to me, of me. And that's a good thought. We should be wanting more and more of God, more and more of him. 
more and more of righteousness in our hearts, in our minds, in our actions, to be like Him. But we also should be hungering and thirsting for righteousness around us, not just in us, but around us. Longing for righteousness in our families, righteousness in our communities, righteousness in our workplace. We hear of things that go on, even Dan, when he came this morning and shared some little bit about the homeless ministry and last night and, and things, and people's lives, and you just hear about the, and, and it should break you and you long, you should long for the things that are just unrighteous in this world to be made right. Do you long for that? If you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you can be happy because it's as they shall be filled. Filled. The Lord gave Adam a belly with an appetite for food. And then that same Lord made a garden full of fruit trees to satisfy the very hunger he had created. God made Adam with a thirst, and then God made most of the world water with rain and rivers to satisfy that man's thirst. God doesn't give us a hunger and then not provide what is needed to satisfy that hunger. That would be cruel. God makes us with a hunger and a thirst and then provides what is needed to meet that hunger. The same spiritually. God has placed within the heart of every human being a longing for righteousness. Unfortunately, like Eve, most are deceived by the devil, believing that satisfaction will be found in that which God does not permit. Satan does a complete lie and says, no, that tree will satisfy you, not destroy you. God says, don't eat that one. It'll destroy you, not satisfy you. And then man has chosen to follow Satan. And then we wonder why we see destruction everywhere. But God has provided all that we need to satisfy our hunger the hungry and thirsty soul in himself. Jesus says, come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Those who long for righteousness, he says, I'm, I'm going to fill them. They're going to be filled. I told you earlier about the couple and I know I use this illustration a lot, but it's so, so good. I was at a pastor's conference, and uh, it was quite a few pastors there. I would say maybe three, four hundred people there in attendance at this, this church meeting. And the way the sanctuary was laid out, it was kind of like ours in which the the platform was a square, but they had chairs that wrapped around on this side 
and then all the way around. I happened to be sitting over there, so I was kind of seeing the side angle of the guy preaching, but from where I was, I could see most of everybody else without turning around, I could just from the angle that I had. And I don't remember the man's sermon completely. It was a great sermon, but just a sermon of, you know, do you want more of the Lord and to be right with God and calling people to, to repentance and a fresh uh, outpouring of the Spirit in their life. And, and so the preacher brought his thing to a close and he said, well, I'm going to have an altar call. If you want to, you know, just a fresh commitment or more of the Lord or whatever, I want you to come down. And so I did what my old old pastor used to tell us to do. He'd said an altar calls to peak. He, he taught us to do to peak so we could pray for the ones that were coming up. So I started peeking from over there. You know, everybody's heads bowed, eyes are closed, nobody looking around type thing. And I, I'm looking to see. And as soon as he said, if you want to come up, the altar's open, come right away. About the third row back in the middle, I see some movement. And it was Viv Brother Vivian. Now he was probably, oh, I don't know, in his 90s at the time. He couldn't move real fast. It took him a while to get out of his chair. And then he helped his wife get up out of her chair and they slowly started moving down the aisle they got down to the to the platform and it may have had two steps maybe a few more not a real high platform and it was a struggle for them just to kneel down they barely got down there to pray they were the first to move at this altar call now, Brother Vivian and his wife, they had been missionaries in Africa for over 40 years. He was probably one of the godliest men I've ever known. Just filled with the love of God and filled with joy. and He was a man of prayer. And I was sitting over there looking at and I thought, why are you guys going up to this altar call? I'm looking around, I'm thinking, you guys, you, you two are probably the godliest people in this room. The rest of us should be down there at the altar, not you guys. And then it just hit me. That's why they're the godliest people in this room. Because even though they're in their 90s, and over, even though they'd spent their whole life serving the Lord, they want more of Him. They're hungry to know Jesus better and more fully. And in the same way, their hunger and thirst for righteousness, I, I saw in them their meekness. I mean, they could have been, we, we, we were missionaries for 40 something years in Africa. And, and that's back when being a missionary in Africa was <laughs> difficult. <laughs> they had a, a spiritual strength that, again, probably nobody in that room had. And yet. They didn't see their strength. They saw the strength of the Lord. And they were going to Him to be strengthened. What about you? First of all, are you meek? Again, I said, what does it look like? That's what Jesus told us. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. The yoke is that 
instrument that would attach one ox to the other so that they could pull the cart together. Jesus says, come over, get hitched up with me or get yoked to me and learn from me what meekness is. Study the life of Christ and follow his example and you will have, you'll be meek. Secondly, do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Maybe you don't. Maybe spiritually you're hungering and thirsting for unrighteousness. You have an appetite and a craving for carnal things. I don't know that you just sit back and say, oh, God, just change my heart. You know, say, well, God made me this way. He hasn't given me a hunger for righteousness. Don't blame God. There are some things you can do. One of the very practical ways, if you are hungering and thirsting for the things of this world, maybe you're not even saved. If a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Maybe that's the revelation that you've not been born again. The love of God has not been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. But maybe you are a child of God. The things of this world are becoming appealing to you. A very practical thing you can do is fast. Fasting is a very mysterious thing. I don't understand it. It's, it's mystical. Somebody says, oh, great. Joel Walters is teaching mysticism. No, I'm teaching the Bible. And Jesus said that when he went away, which he did, he went back into heaven, then his disciples would fast. We are his disciples. He's not here. The bridegroom has gone away into heaven. And so we need to fast. And there is something of denying just the body, even the appetite of the belly. As I look to the Lord, and I say, Lord, I want you. I want to be filled with you more than I want my belly to be filled with food. And God will honor that. It's that, it's that simple. And then instead of feasting on the hamburgers at lunchtime, you go and you read your Bible and pray and you feast on him instead. And something happens in those times of fasting. God miraculously will transform your heart and give you a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And you might say, I don't know, I haven't had that experience. I was starving when I fasted. <laughs> well, maybe you need to fast more often then. And find satisfaction in God. But fasting is just a very practical way. And the second thing is, spiritually speaking, maybe you're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness because you have been feasting on carnal things. You know, when you eat a bunch of junk food, then you have an appetite for junk food. If you stop eating junk food, you don't have an appetite for it. When I was in high school, we well, was going to go on a trip to Colorado, and they told us before, they said, oh, the altitude, you know, you don't want to get altitude sickness, drink a lot of water, uh, you know, before the trip and on the trip. Well, I decided, you know, I'm going to do that for a couple of weeks before the trip. So two weeks before the trip, I drank nothing but water, all kinds of water. And then I went on the trip, nothing but water. And by the time I got back, you know what? A soda tasted horrible. You drank it, you're like, oh, this is awful. How did I like this before? Because I hadn't been drinking it. 
I'd been drinking that good water, and now I just wanted water. I had an appetite for water. My appetite had been changed. And maybe that's what you need to do. You need to, your, ap, your, your spiritual appetite needs to be changed. And you need to put some other things out of your life. Maybe not even sins. It says, put aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. There are some things that aren't sins, but they're just weights that need to be put aside because they're slowing you down in your spiritual progress. And just feast on the, the true spiritual food of the Word of God and, and prayer and, uh, and say, Oh God, I, I want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want that. I've not been hungering like I should lately, and I want to. So, Lord, I'm going to fast, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to turn off the TV, or I'm going to turn off the Internet and whatever, and I'm just going to, and, and I want you to give me this hunger again. That works. I know it works because I've done it. And I can tell you from, from, from my own experience that God will honor that. And He'll bless you. He will bless you with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And then He'll fill you.